I spent 26 years in the New Jersey State Police. 14 of those years I was, worked undercover in narcotics. And I retired a detective lieutenant from that job. But when I retired, I felt very bad about my role in implementing what today I feel is not only a failed war on drugs, it's far worse. It's a self-perpetuating and constantly expanding policy disaster. And there's no way to fix it. There's no way to patch it up or repair it. We gotta end it. We gotta end it like we ended alcohol prohibition in 1933. When I went in the state police, it was 1964. That picture in the upper left-hand corner is a picture of when I graduated that year. And right underneath it is a picture more or less of when I graduated from their Narcotic Bureau. I went into narcotics in 1970. That was the beginning of the war on drugs. When I joined the state police, in 1964, we had 1,700 troopers and we had a seven-man narcotic unit. Well, we seemed perfectly adequate for the job we needed to do. Six years later, we had exactly the same numbers. And it was adequate because when we started the war on drugs, we really didn't have much of a drug problem in the United States. What little drug problem we did have was mainly soft drugs, drugs like marijuana, hashish, some LSD, psilocybin, the mushrooms, the mind-bending drugs. You know, the hard drugs, such as heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, were virtually unheard of back then. Certainly unheard of compared to what they are today. And if you go back and you look at the statistics from 1970, you'll see that the likelihood of anybody dying that year in the United States as a result of the drug culture was less than the likelihood of them dying from falling down the steps in their own house. It was less than the likelihood of them dying from choking to death on their own food at dinner. But we started a war on drugs. So you've got to wonder, what, what was really the purpose behind this? Right? In October of that year, thanks to this funding policy from the federal government, we went from a seven-man narcotic unit to a 76-person narcotic bureau overnight, all paid for by the feds. And this was replicated across the whole United States. Now think about that. When you increase the number of cops with one job to do by 11 times its size, you set up a great deal of expectation. The expectation with us in that coming year was that we were going to make at least 11 times more drug arrests than we did the year before, and we were literally off to the races. That's how this thing became a, a numbers game with the police. It's all about numbers. After two weeks training, they had the 76 of us uh, line up and count off one, two, three, one, two, three. Every third person became an undercover agent. I was one of those three, so that's where I spent most of the next 14 years of my life. When we hit the streets, we were supposed to arrest drug dealers, and that was really hard because, as I just said, there weren't many drug dealers around. They weren't in, certainly in, in their suburbs, they weren't in rural America, they weren't in our schools. So instead of targeting us on drug dealers, they targeted us on young people, folks like you, people in college, people in high school, or in between. And when I would weasel my way into these small friendship groups, groups of 10 or 15 young people, come Friday night, they're out of school for the weekend, or if they're working, they're off work for the weekend, somebody might say, hey, you want to get high? And if nobody said that, that was my job. So if anybody took us up, me up on that offer, <laughs> then one of the friends who had access to the family car or some other way to get to the city would go around to the others and say, hey, you want to get high tonight? Some might say, ah, I'm studying for a test Monday. I'll catch you next time. Others might say, yeah, you know, while you're in the city, pick me up a couple joints, will you? 
Or they might say, you know, I hear there's some really good blotter acid out there. If you run across any, pick me up a hit of blotter acid. One dose of blotter acid, LSD. When they'd come to me, I'd put my order in for that same tiny amount of drugs. We're talking maybe $5 worth of drugs. They'd jump in the car, off they'd go to the city. An hour later, they'd come back and they'd hand those things out to their friends. When they handed it to me, they became a big time drug dealer. Because that's what we labeled them. And that is what stuck. And I'd stay in that group until I got every single friend in the group. It was really easy to do because these people weren't drug dealers. They were young folks doing what we used to call dipping and dabbing, experimenting with drugs, and then accommodating their friends. They weren't making any money on this. They weren't even getting their gas money back for that trip to the city. So the second night, that person didn't want to make the run. The second night is person B, and the third night is person C. And I would stay till I got every single person in the group. And I might be working 10 of these little friendship groups in different suburbs at the same time. So very quickly, I would come in with cases on a lot of people. About every two months, I'd come in with maybe 100 people that I'd had cases on like this. We'd have a big raid. Five o'clock in the morning, we'd swoop into their neighborhoods with hundreds of cops and we'd kick their doors down and drag those people out in chains. When we got them all down to the police station, we would have already alerted the, the reporters to be there with their cameras and snap their pictures in the perp walk and splash them all over the front page of their local paper, destroying any credibility, any respectability that these young folks had. When we got them all lined up against that back wall, my boss would come out. And he'd say to those reporters, you see that? You see that? There's a hundred major drug dealers we took out of your community. This is the worst thing that has ever happened in America. This is going to destroy society as we know it. And your only hope is that thin blue line of police. We need more money so we can hire more police. We need faster cars and better equipment and radios and guns that shoot a whole bunch of bullets and bulletproof vests. We need, uh, we need harsher laws. We need mandatory minimum sentences. We need three strikes you're out laws. We need, we need, we need. And the reporters would go away and write horror stories, scaring the public to death. And the public would read those stories and say, give it to them, give it to them. And then we'd go out the next year and do even worse. And we've been doing that now for 44 years every year, worse than the year before. Now let me tell you about those young folks, what happened to them. Back in 1970, we only had one law about drugs. It wasn't like it is today. That law said, it's illegal to distribute a controlled dangerous substance. And then it gave you a big long list of those substances. There was not even anything in that law that said any money had to exchange hands. Well, when Mr. Clinton was smoking but not inhaling was exactly when I was doing this to those young people. And he was college age at that time. Well, let me tell you, if I would have infiltrated his group, it would have been curtains for Mr. Clinton. You know, drug use is a very social thing, especially soft drug use. Six folks get up in a circle, spark up one joint, take two tokes and hand it to the person on the right. And it comes around the second time and uh, people are getting high and they're not really concentrating on what's going on too much. So the second time around, the person hands me what's now a roach. And I grab that thing and act like I'm what we used to call bogarting, the, like I'm going to smoke it all myself. But what, it, what I'm really doing is I'm knocking the flame off the end of that and sticking what's left of it in my pocket because that night, I'm going to 
submit that as evidence, as evidence that the person who handed it to me is a major drug dealer. So if Mr. Clinton had been in that circle, it wouldn't have mattered whether he inhaled or not. The mere handing of that joint to me would have confirmed that he would never be an attorney, much less the President of the United States. So with that, with that one law, since it was only one law, everybody was being sentenced exactly the same. Seven years in state prison. Seven years. Now they all had to serve a third of max before they could come out on parole. So two and a half years after each one of these raids I had, another hundred young folks were coming out of prison. What were they going to do? We'd snatched them off the streets in the prime of their life when they're trying to get their education. They don't have any education. And if they did have education, who the hell's going to hire them? They're dope dealers. That's what we said they were. So what are they going to do to feed, feed their families? huh? What they're going to do is they're going to turn right back to the drug culture, the very group we say we're trying to save them from. Only now they're going to become real, honest-to-goodness drug dealers. And for every new real drug dealer, you've got to have a whole bunch of new real drug users. So every one of those folks is out there actively recruiting younger people to pick up those needles and become the next statistic. And that, folks, is how this became a self-perpetuating, constantly expanding policy disaster. There's no way to fix it. We have to end it. 